Well, good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5 as we continue our walk through our Fruit of the Spirit sermon series this summer. Galatians chapter 5. If you do not have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that as a gift from us and make that your own. We want you to have a Bible. You can mark in it. I give you permission to mark in it, highlight in it, circle stuff, put notes in the margin, all of that. Okay. Now, as we're getting started, I need to tell you something. You may not know this about me, uh, but I pride myself on being a coffee snob. Okay. At my last church, my best friend, uh, he ran a coffee shop and, and that was also my hangout place. I would hang out there three, four times a week. And during that process, I learned a lot about coffee as we tried different coffee beans from around the world. Okay. And coffee is uh, similar to tea or wine in that it can be discussed, the flavor of it can be discussed in multiple flavors in a single sip. All right, so some of you are wine connoisseurs and you s swirl it around the glass and you smell it and you act like you know what you're doing. You have a sophisticated palate, okay? Um, well, so you can do the same uh, with coffee, all right? So here's what I'm saying. When you take a sip of a great cup of coffee, it has a robust flavor. It's not one single note, but rather it, is a, it, it hits your palate in waves, Releasing multiple sensations that fire off one in succession after the other. Brown sugar with a hint of ginger snap and pear. A taste that's round and smooth. Some of you are like, honey, grab your stuff. The pastor's gone liberal. We're getting out of here. The rest of you are like, just give me my Folgers. My point is this. There is a point to this illustration, believe it or not, that at this point in our Fruit of the Spirit series, right, where we are, that the fruit is building a robust, complex, magnificent aroma of God's character, not in isolation, but in complex harmony balancing each other. You can pull one attribute out and you can look at it and you can say, it is beautiful. But when you look at the holistic building of the fruit of the spirit and you see it in its robustness all together, it changes the world. It is God's character that the longer we walk with the spirit becomes our character, the fruit of the Spirit. All right, Galatians 5. I will begin in verse 19. Listen as I read. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, Here's our attribute today, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning as we do every week. We come to your word we open it up, we read it, and we pause right now to beg that your Holy Spirit would teach us, would open our eyes and our mind to understand 
what the scripture means in its fullness, to understand it in its context, and to help to apply that to our lives. But Father, this is, we acknowledge right now, this is not a mental ascent, but rather we are inviting your Holy Spirit to convict us and to empower us to walk out in newness of life, and we are declaring we want to be like you. Apply this to our lives, both individually and collectively as a whole. If we are going to be a church that impacts our community, that shines the light of Jesus in a powerful, impactful way, it must be your light, it must be your character through us. So allow us collectively to examine this fruit of gentleness. We pray all of that in Jesus' name, amen. In 1 Kings chapter 19, after Elijah had called down fire from heaven atop Mount Carmel, that engulfed 450 prophets of Baal, suddenly he felt completely isolated and alone, and he was fearful for his life because Queen Jezebel was highly upset at the circumstances that unfolded. And Elijah runs for his life. He runs and he runs and he runs. And he runs to Mount Horeb, which if you recall in your Bible, that is where Moses met with God and got the the Mosaic Covenant and the Ten Commandments. And Moses met with the Lord on that mountain. In, uh, and Israel camped at the base of it. And the description of that event was like this. And the Lord descended upon the mountain and there was fire and there was an earthquake and there were peals of thunder and flashes of lightning as Moses was up there. And now Elijah runs there, and in striking contrast to the earthquake, flashes of lightning, peals of thunder experienced by Moses, Elijah will not hear God in the rushing wind, in the earthquake or the fire, but in a gentle blowing breeze. The fruit of the Spirit, a characteristic of the almighty living God is gentleness. Today, as we use the word in regular vernacular, gentleness means the quality of being kind, tender, mild-mannered, a softness of action, typically a feminine quality. Now, some of that is okay, but in reality, that definition needs some work. The Greek word here that's translated gentleness, uh, praoutes, is also translated humility in other instances, and is the same word used in the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek. In fact, you will find humility, meekness, and gentleness commonly paired together as synonymous terms, often used in pairs, side by side, but those three words. And so this morning, I want us to think in robust terms. I want us to think in gentleness, meekness, humility. I've explained to you before that meekness, I want you to think of the image of a broken horse. A horse that is no longer wild, but rather has come into uh, submission, a surrendered horse. That horse is just as strong, just as beautiful, just as powerful and fast, but has come under the command of the master, and he will go wherever the master directs. He is correctable. He is teachable. That is what the word meekness means. A couple weeks ago, when I was in Uganda, we were, we were visiting some of our partnerships, and we went to a school called New Bright School. And it was in the middle of nowhere in a, in a pretty poor rural community. And as we were visiting that school, uh, I ran across one of the teachers. He was, he was a young man named Muhammad. And Muhammad had this, 
this life, this vibrancy. He was a very sharp young man. And, and you could sense, man, that, that guy has the impressions of Jesus on him. And so in a short time I was there, I, I just wanted to get to know him and hear his story. And here was his story. Uh, he was raised in a Muslim family, uh, very impoverished. He was one of the sponsored children. So, so poor that he had to have sponsorship in order to go to school. Uh, to get food and to go to school. And he had uh, been able to attend a, a Christian school. As a Muslim attending a Christian school, uh, he had heard the gospel, but he didn't come to faith until the very end of his schooling. And he said, I needed hope. I needed hope. And, and I, you know, the, the spirit just, opened my eyes. I, I found hope in life. And for the first time, I'm filled with this joy. We had finished his schooling in order to become a, a teacher. And he got offered this job at, at New Life, uh, New Life School, New Bright School. And, um, but it, it wasn't going to pay much, barely enough to get by. And it was going to be in a rural kind of out of the way community. Certainly wasn't going to really help his career or anything like that. And as he was praying through that, really thinking he would reject that offer, he just heard the voice of the Lord say, listen, someone paid for your schooling and you didn't pay a dime for it. Now I want you to go serve at this school and I need you to remember that your treasure is in heaven. I'll take care of the rest. And there he was at that school. And I thought, what an incredible picture of meekness of being surrendered and allowing God to steer us in life. This past spring on Wednesday nights during Recharge, if you've had the opportunity to be with us, we walked through and took an extended look at humility. And we discovered that the foundation for humility lies in being able to see ourselves rightly in light of God's holiness. You being humble is directly tied to your ability to see yourself rightly in light of God's holiness. Because so often we like to minimize the gravity of sin because it makes us feel better, okay? But it hinders your ability to be humble. The Bible would say this, you weren't drowning in the pool of your sin and fighting uh, to stay afloat, and you didn't call out for Jesus, and he threw a life raft and reeled you in. Your salvation is not that picture. Rather, the picture is you were miles off and miles deep in the ocean of your sin. The Bible actually says you were dead. And in order for Jesus to save you, he entered in. A lifeguard on the shore who entered in, who fought the waves, who entered into that water and found you. You weren't calling out to him. The Bible says you were an enemy of God when he came and found you and brought you back. That that is what Christ did for you to save you, to open your eyes, to make you his own. And only when you see that, when you see the magnitude of it, when you are blown away by it, will you be able to be humble? Because it's in direct relation that he is the holy, perfect God of the universe. And this is all that he has done in his goodness and kindness and gentleness and in his pursuit of you. Then you can be humble. Gentleness, as it relates to other people, means a willingness to bend low. That's actually the root of the word, to bend low, to condescend, and even endure hostility and criticism without outbursts of anger or aggression. Catch this. It also means that in your response, you are keenly aware of other people's feelings and therefore are compassionate and understanding. That's what it means to be gentle. Listen to Ephesians 4, 2. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, show tolerance for one another in love. When something is of value, 
you instinctively treat it gently. Okay, if something's of value, right? Moms are always hollering, don't kick the ball in the house, you're gonna break something. Or when you carry a crystal vase, you watch your steps, you plan out your route. Have you seen someone who has a car that they love? Maybe it's a new car, maybe it's an old car, it's a vintage car, and, and they close the doors gently. I'm like, this is a 3,000 pound car, and you're like delicately touching the, right? Or even Garrett, right? Garrett, he did our announcements, this big strong guy who can, can't even scratch his own neck because he has muscles, right? But now as he holds his newborn, Leighton, this little baby girl who's just weeks old, tenderness, gentleness. To be gentle with others at its root is to believe that people have enough value that you give them the respect of personal dignity. And practically it means that others feel at ease or are restful in your presence? Ask yourself that question. Are others at ease and restful in your presence? Can they be themselves and express an opinion without fear of intimidation? You see, the opposite of being gentle is being dominant, aggressive, quarrelsome, manipulating people by force and not persuasion. You just say whatever you want and let the chips fall where they may. Hey, it's the truth. I mean, let others deal with it. See, this world is full of that sort of arrogance and dominance. In fact, it's what we find entertaining. It's what we watch on TV. Oh, that's, look at that. That's spicy. Look at them just kind of stir it up. This is entertaining. Give me my popcorn. It's even how how we take our news in this format given by a bombastic scoffer who endlessly ridicules everyone on outside of their circle. It's also important as we think about gentleness to know that there is a pseudo form of gentleness that's actually timidity and in its worst form becomes cowardice. Certainly that's not the virtue that we're aiming at this morning. Jesus was neither of these And yet he described himself, self-described as gentle. Many years ago, I was working through a passage of scripture that as, as I wrestled with it and came to its conclusion, it changed my trajectory of how I think about ministry and dealing with other people. John chapter five Jesus is walking through Jerusalem and he passes by the pool of Bethesda. He's just walking, it's happenstance, he's going by. The narrative doesn't describe that his disciples are there. If they are there, it only focuses on Jesus. Now there right next to the temple is the pool of Bethesda. And and as you'd learn through the narrative that it was was customary that lame people, uh, people who needed healing would go, they would sit by that pool. They had this belief that an angel would come and stir the waters. And the first one who could enter into the waters would get healing. John five, Jesus is passing by. He goes out of his way and he approaches a man, not a man who's talking to him. He goes out of his way and he approaches a man who has been lame for 38 years years. And Jesus begins to talk to him. He says, hey, do you want to be healed? And the guy's like, yeah, but I, I can't get in the water fast enough. I've been sitting here alone. I never get my healing. Doesn't have legs. You can imagine he only has use of his arms and he would can't get in in time. And Jesus says, pick up your pallet and walk. Just like that. Now, that guy picks up his pallet and begins to 
to walk. He's soon met on the road by Pharisees. And it's a Sabbath day. And they say to him, hey, you can't be carrying your pallet. The guy's response is, it's, you need to zero in on it. Because he just says, well, the guy who healed me told me to pick up my pallet and walk. And they said, who healed you? And he says, I don't know. Pause the story right there. I want to ask a crucial question. Very important to understand this narrative. What is the most magnificent gift that Jesus could have given this guy? You say, salvation. Eternal life. Could have had the conversation that he had two chapters prior with Nicodemus, right? You must be born again. And he could have sat down next to him and said, hey, we need to talk about sin and forgiveness. And I'm about to die on the cross. You pause the story right here and you ask the question, is that guy saved? No. He doesn't even know who Jesus is. How could he be saved? I mean, he's not one of the blind beggars on, on the road that's saying, son of David, come have mercy upon me like I figured out who you are. He doesn't do any of that. He doesn't even know who Jesus is. So when I was working through the text, like, like why, would, why doesn't Jesus tell him about salvation? Why does he heal him? Because he's been lame for 38 years. For 38 years, the duration of his life, all he's done is beg for money. Been told by every passerby, you're a curse of God. You're a drain on our nation. The reality is either your mom sinned or you sinned, but you're absolutely worthless. And Jesus, in absolute tenderness and gentleness, see, he's walking by and he sees this guy and he goes and finds him out of nothing but compassion and heals him. And catch this in the narrative, he circles back around introduces himself and talks to the guy about sin. Because he first met him and pulled him out of his absolute misery and depth of despair. I mean, so what you find about Jesus, he always addresses sin. He never avoids it. He never compromises. And yet... He did so after this incredibly tender moment where he just healed the guy. I worked through that on my own heart and it changed my trajectory and how I deal with people with a gentleness, absolutely staggering. Now the Pharisees stand as the foil to gentleness. They show up, they're rigid, they're legalistic. They're always asking, is it lawful? Never, is it kind or good? Paul used to be like them. But after being changed by Jesus, after being filled and shaped by the Holy Spirit, he so valued people that he said, to the Jews, I become as a Jew. To the weak, as weak. I become all things to all men so that by all means I may save some. Gentleness in the ancient world was emphatically not 
a virtue. Right? This sort of humility was generally despised by popular culture, and especially among men. Real men were neither gentle nor humble. Real men are strong, dominant, powerful winners. And the social etiquette of the day was boasting of being such. And let's be honest, guys, especially men in the room, I'm talking to you. Most of us, a lot of us, if we're honest, we don't even like the sound of being gentle. We view it, hey, that sounds weak. Are you calling me a sissy or passive or timid? And then you think, wait a second, Jesus took a bullwhip into the temple and started throwing over tables. That's my Jesus. All right. He stood before the leaders and called them a brood of vipers right to their face. He ran off thousands who began to follow him uh, because they just wanted food. And he looked them right in the eye and he said, listen, if you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have any part in me. And after, after thousands walked away, he turns to his disciples and said, hey, you want to go too? So, pastor, help me balance this out. This strength, this boldness, this gentleness. Listen, gentleness is never at the expense of truth. It is a quality alongside truth. Remember, we're not talking about a personality. We're not talking about timid mannerisms okay, that has you recoil into a shell. This is why we lay the foundation of humility, meekness, gentleness. The foundation for genuinely caring about people so that you are considerate of their feelings and their past hurts. Now, the best example, biblical example that I can think of is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul is writing back to the church in Thessalonica and he is describing what it took for him and for his team to give the gospel, okay? And if you comb through there, you can see he lists out five attributes of what it took for him to give the gospel. The first one, he says, is boldness. We had a boldness to share the gospel with you. Paul was persecuted in... Uh, uh, Philippi, they were beaten and thrown in jail. He was run out of Thessalonica by a mob. Okay, they, they drug people out in the streets looking for him and he had to hit, hit the back. He went one town over in Berea and those from Thessalonica came and found him and ran him out of Berea also. And yet Paul says, listen, in order to give the gospel, to share the gospel, it took a boldness. It took overcoming opposition. He goes on to list. He says, listen, listen we, we were all about pleasing God and not man. And then the third attribute that he lists there, he says, we were as gentle as a nursing mother with you. In fact, he ends that section by saying, we gave you our very own lives. As gentle as a nursing mother. Now the fifth quality here, you can look at it there. He goes on to say, we exhorted you as a father. That means we corrected you. So work all of these things together. There is a boldness to overcome opposition and to speak the gospel even in the midst of persecution, it's because I love you enough that I'm willing to be bold to tell you about Jesus, even if it's not the social norm, even if there's cost for me. But simultaneously, he would say, I was as gentle as a nursing mother. But that doesn't mean I don't correct you. It doesn't mean I don't give, give, uh, say the hard things in your life. It doesn't mean I don't give accountability as, as an exhorting father, but still gentle as a a nursing mother. You see, gentleness is strength under control. Strength harnessed and wisdom of application. You hear that? Wisdom 
is how to apply in life. You see, a surgeon uses a scalpel, not a butcher's cleaver. Biblically, men are called to be watchful, to stand firm in the faith, to act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. You see that? This means lead, provide, protect your family, but do so with gentleness because it's godly. In 1839, George Buthane wrote, perhaps no Christian virtue is less prayed for or less cultivated than gentleness. It's considered belonging to a person's personality or mannerisms, and seldom do we consider to not be gentle a sin. Right? We pray for patience. We pray for peace, for purity, for self-control. But when was the last time you prayed for gentleness? Or told those closest to you, hey, will you hold me accountable when I'm not gentle? Now, as we wind down, I want us to be in awe of the gentleness of the Son of God himself. Now, again, Jesus is strength. You are to never think of him as weak. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The Bible says he spoke and all of creation came into being. The Bible says that he sustains all of creation by his own will. That he is the sovereign one. He is the one who was and is and is to come. He is the one who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, a beast of burden. When he hung up upon the cross, he was mindful enough of his mother to give her away to John. He was mindful enough to take care of his mother while he is bleeding and suffocating to death. You know, Jesus' brothers didn't believe. In fact, there are repeated times where they mock him and they challenge him. And yet he personally appeared in the resurrection to his brother James. Imagine that moment. Because that moment is not a, aha, you're wrong, James, look now. It is a Thomas moment. Come here. Touch. You can see. Remember when Peter denied Jesus three times? The night of his betrayal, everyone falls away. John tells us that Peter was so confused, he went back to his old lifestyle. He's so disappointed and discouraged, he just goes back fishing. And Jesus comes and finds him in the same spot where it all began three years prior. And Jesus did it in the same way that the same, oh, you've been fishing all night and you haven't caught anything. We'll cast your net on this side. And he hauls the big thing in. And Peter recognizes immediately, jumps into the water. He's like, it's Jesus. When Peter gets to the shore, Jesus has made a charcoal fire. There are only two times in the whole of Scripture that charcoal fire is ever mentioned. And it's earlier in John because Peter was warming his hands around a charcoal fire when he denied Jesus. So Jesus, when Peter gets to shore, reconstructs a charcoal fire. You, you know the way that smell brings back a memory? And then right there, Jesus says to Peter and asks him three times, do you love me? Because Peter had denied him three times. What's Jesus doing? And one of the most tender, 
sensitive, incredibly powerful moments of redemption. Jesus is allowing Peter to three times affirm him. And then he says, all right, tend my sheep. In each of these situations, you find a gentleness, a compassion, a sensitivity to meet someone in the depths of their hurt, even in their sin, and lead them to life. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There is one passage in the whole of Scripture that describes the heart of Jesus. Right? And by heart, we mean if you could peel back the layers, if you could find the passion inside, the one thing, if you know me, this is the one thing I need you to know about me. This one passage, it seems, it's, it seems absurd to us that God would pull back and say, if you could know one thing about me, here's what I want you to know. I'm gentle and humble in heart. You put those two words together, it's a picture of being approachable. Think about this. I'm going to read for you a short clip out of the book Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortman. No one in human history has ever been more approachable than Jesus. No prerequisites. No hoops to jump through. Your very burden is what qualifies you to come. No payment is required because his rest is a gift. It's not a transaction. Believer, are we like Jesus? Are you approachable? Do you value people as God does such that you're tender with their soul? Do you seek the fruit of gentleness? You may be here this morning. You are weary and heavy laden. Listen to me. The Son of God came, the Holy King of the universe, the one whom every man and woman will stand before on judgment day. And he would rather save you and be known by his mercy than any other thing. And this morning he says, come. For I am gentle and humble in heart. Come, you will find rest for your soul. Come, all you have to do is come. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, right now we as your people come. And all across this room we are reminded by your incredible character, by who you've revealed yourself to be, by how you want to be known, by your mercy and by your grace and by your gentleness. Father, I pray that we all come and drink again from the fountain of the water of living life find rest for our souls. Father, if there's anyone here this day that does not know you, I pray right now in Jesus' name that they would come, that you would give them faith and that they would, they would come to you and find life. 
Father, I pray that we, as a people, are found to be gentle because we so value people that we're sensitive towards all that they are. Father, we know that we need your help in doing that. Father, shave off the edges as we surrender to you this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.